Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hi, Dacre. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Todd, nice to hear your voice again. Nice to be on the podcast with you. Excited to talk about all things Dracula, Bram Stoker, and, you know, spooky seasons winded down. So, you know, we can all take a deep breath, but uh, horror still remains, doesn't it? That's right. It exact yes, it absolutely <laughs> does. And now, now this episode is coming out at the beginning of uh, of the year, but we're recording this. And correct me if I'm wrong. Is this is this Brahms' hundred and seventy sixth birthday? You got today. It. We're your, recording your, on your timing is impeccable. This is the only podcast I'm doing on Brahms' one seventy sixth, and it's you know it's a neat day to to sort of really reflect back on what my great grand uncle you know brought to this world on this day a troubled birth, a troubled childhood in Clontarf, Ireland. But, you know, this is where it all started for for Dracula fans worldwide. This is it. I'm honored to be the interview that you're giving on this uh, on this historic day. So jumping right into this, I think, you know, uh, I'm curious, you know, what was your first memory as a child knowing that you had this famous author relative. Do you let's go back to, to young Dacre and, to, yeah. and talk about that. <laughs> way way back at my birth, you know, in, in the delivery room when I'm coming out, you know, there's the doctors there with the crucifix. <laughs> Not another stoker. Another oh my crucifix. God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, that that's that's a little exaggeration, but I guess it mm-hmm. you know I I I'd have thought back because I get asked this question, you know, what's it like growing up as a stoker? I grew up in Montreal, Canada. Uh, we were not like the Adams family or the Munsters, you know, nothing like just normal people. Um, you know, I was more aware of Bram's younger brother, my great grandfather, George Stoker, because his son, uh, Thomas, came over to, to Montreal and married my grandmother and started the family. But I really didn't know much about Uncle Bram until around Halloween season, at about the age of 12 or 13. Kids would come to the door and their parents would be standing there kind of going, <laughs> it's the Stokers. What are you going to do? Give us candy or take our blood, you know? And I had <laughs> seen my first Dracula show. I, I don't know when I started watching Dark Shadows, but that was the beginning. And so it, it was probably, you know, around that time I said, Dad, what is going on? And he, he explained to me, you know, there's this book that our, you know, great grand uncle actually wrote, and it's pretty famous around the world. But Todd, at that time, you know, this was, you know, early 70s. I wasn't aware of the research that had gone on by two Boston College professors, McNally and Florescu, who wrote really the first in-depth analysis in search of Dracula of, you know, the writing of Dracula, what little they knew then, who was Vlad the Impaler and all that stuff. But that is the first book that I read. Now, I fast forward from about the age of 12 to college when I started getting serious into it and wanted to know. And I read that and I had to give a, a speech and an oral interpretation of literature class. So, you know, with that, I became the expert in the family. And I just kind of started, you know, thinking this this is pretty cool stuff. I was so into sport, training for the Olympic Games and modern pentathlon that I didn't really have time for delving into horror. But it was always sort of in the back of my mind. I'd see a, a vampire movie would come out. I'd go watch it. And, you know, every now and then a new biography would come out. So it it wasn't like my life changed being a a relative of a famous author, but it was something that just sort of was riding in the background, you know, up until, you know, 2003 when I really got serious into it. Yeah. And the second part of that question was, you know, your first, not only, you know, that childhood memory of knowing when you were, where you had this famous author relative, but your first experience with the character of Dracula, and you mentioned Dark Shadows, was that... Was that maybe as far back as it goes, kind of finally seeing Dracula in film or TV form? Well, I mean, uh, he wasn't in, in, in that show, but he was a vampire yeah. represented. And of course, right. I was watching the Munsters so, and the Adams family and you know, Grandpa, you know, was pretty close to Dracula. Um, so, you know, you're aware of it, as many people are, you know, Todd, really, when you think about it. So many people know the story. They haven't written the, they haven't read the novel, but they've seen a movie film, a cartoon, Sesame Street, something, you become aware of it. And organically, 
you know, is a sexy word these days to sort of absorb um, what some version of what Bram created. And I, I do remember sure. at boarding school on a Friday night, the movie nights, you know, it was um, the Roman Polanski film, the, the, the Fearless Vampire Hunters. There's, again, no Dracula. One of my favorites. But, but we knew what was going on. We knew <laughs> yeah. that, you know, that, that this was inspired by uh, Bram Stoker. And of course, when the credits come up, it says inspired by Bram Stoker. You know what teenage boys do? They all look at young Stoker over here and jump on him, start giving him <laughs> noogies and everything. So, you know, that right, was, right. was like always a welcome right. thing. But um, right. I, I can't honestly remember the first Dracula film that I actually watched, although I was very impressed when my uncle, Uncle Patty, was invited from Montreal to go to New York in 77 by the producers of the Frank Langella uh, stage play when, when Langella was on stage before he went on screen. And that was a huge thing in the family because it's like, oh, my gosh. Uncle Patty got invited to New York, you know, on the Broadway to watch this, this stage play and meet Langella. That sort of changed the bar a little bit. So we all got a little more serious, a little more aware. Um, and, and that sort of, you know, put us on that, you know, that cruise control to what's going to come next. You know, what are we going to see? Who's, who's going to talk to us next about this thing? Right, right. Yeah, I grew up uh, loving loving horror films, loving class the the classic Universal monsters and a lot of that stuff. And and um, of course, you mentioned fearless vampire killers and and things like that. And I just those have so much influence. It's so weird to me when I think back of you know my childhood and my early teens. Uh, the, it's almost like things are blurred. What I watched, so many of these things seem so similar. Um, that I, I've lost track of all the movies and all the stuff I specifically watch. And now I get everything mixed up. Like even, even like Abbott and Costello meet the mummy, Abbott and Costello be friends. Like well, even when they did like the comedy stuff like that, yeah. you know, I remember all that stuff so much and it's all kind of blurred. I don't remember if Abbott and Costello met Dracula, did they? Well, they met Dracula in the Frankenstein film. I think that's. Gotcha. Okay. And that was the only, yeah. um, Bela Lugosi played Dracula on in two different films, and it was the uh, mm. 1931 Todd Browning film. But you know that was the other one was when Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. You got Dracula in there. That was Lugosi's right. second appearance. He was on stage a lot, um, but that was it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's dig into this a little bit. So, how do you think? you know, you're sort of the family historian here. If anybody's going to know, you're probably going to know, but how do you think uh, Bram came up with the idea of Dracula? Was it, did it evolve from like maybe Irish mythology or like Transylvanian folklore? Was it more complex than that? No, you, you've actually hit on two of the main sources. So uh, to begin with, you know, he was born and raised in Ireland, which is rich in this spooky folklore, let's just say cautionary tales. I've, I've just come back from mm -hmm. two weeks there. So, um, and I had a you know, wonderful tour guide in, in Desmond Tours and my company that I work with, Experience Transylvania, we're, we're collaborating with Desmond Tours to go, to go through these sites um, that, that would have inspired Bram, Neolithic sites, these Druid type sites, these you know, burial chambers, you know, when the sun's coming up and the ashes go through here, really old stone stuff, really neat stuff. So we, we got knee deep into the type of stories Bram would have absorbed and listened to as a child but we also were in the town of Sligo which is Western Ireland where we'd experienced a horrifying uh, cholera epidemic that Bram's mom as a 14 year old narrowly escaped and experienced herself and wrote a true account of it and and actually she witnessed people being misdiagnosed very prematurely and tr dragging themselves out of the grave to you know rejoin the, the living so I think Wow. All these things sort of happened to Bram, you know, organically. Here we go again with that term. But then one thing that I've been fortunate enough to do, because I've just, as I said, I'm like shoulder deep now, having written an international bestseller prequel and a sequel, I've had to look into all the books and the notes that Bram used for his research. So you have one side of him that I know he didn't take notes of, that stuff, it just comes natural. But then his research in the London Library, um, the, the, the guy that runs the, the, the London Library, the, for the fundraising for the London Library, found all 26 books that Bram listed in the back of his research notes that live in the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia. So you've got, in, in one country, you've got his source of notes. In London, England, you've got this library where he did the research and kept track of 
everything in these books by actually making little marks in the margins, which is kind of naughty, but hmm. it gives us a really good idea of what he was looking at. And, and, and by that way, Todd, there were books written by a doctor, a priest, scientist, well-respected, who were actually seriously investigating vampirism, trance walk, ghosts, symbolism, uh, superstition, all these things that were sort of out there as a result of the Victorian era taking a deeper dive into, let's just say, fringe science and, and, and superstition. Because if you remember, the power of religion was beginning to wane at this time as scientific exploration. Charles Darwin had just um, published in 1859 The Origin of Species. So religion was you know, not as powerful as it was. And science and pseudoscience, this is when we had tarot cards, we had seance, we had mesmerism. <clears throat> All this was going on. And Bram was a very open-minded person. So, you know, to, to cut this a little bit shorter than I'd normally do, um, mm. I don't want to bore you guys, but Bram mm. took all this in because he was very sensitive to his surroundings. As a theater manager, he knew what people wanted, what people were looking for, and he encapsulated all of this into this novel, a story that made the possibility of a vampire that was in people's consciousness. It was in these books by learned men. He made it seem real. And he brought it to the shores of England on the heels of Jack the Ripper terrorizing London where the police couldn't catch him. And along comes this supernatural creature. And Bram has to conjure up you know, a band of heroes led by Van Helsing and Mina Harker to, to catch this guy. So that's what his inspiration was. It was that nerve that he struck with, with his readers that was already sort of tweaked by the possibilities mm -hmm. that the afterlife, spiritualism, all these things were potentially real. And he just added a heavy dose of horror that could have been real. Because he did a ton of research about Transylvanian superstition and, and merged yeah. that into into his superstition that he was dealing with from Ireland and, and put that on the readers in London. Right. Right. You know, one of the things I always find fascinating with entertainment um, is, you know, looking at things from a, a lens of time passing. I mean, a lot of things that we see the way entertainment was produced in book form or TV form or film form in the eighties, we look back on with the lens of today. And sometimes that stuff isn't, pleasant to look at you know we kind of see how we lived our lives or what things were like and uh and i i always like to overthink these characters of fiction so i want to i want to dig into something with you here a little bit um do, do you think that dracula is a clear villain is he a serial killer is he a victim of his species is he just a hunter trying to survive is he you know to me he's complex and possibly misunderstood but how do you how do you think of Dracula? Well, I, I'm I'm glad to say that you like to think these things to death because uh, I'm the same way. And and you you can look at the character Dracula, you know, many many different ways. As many university students, masters, and doctoral students have done. I mean, since 1962, when this book became a classic, it has been analyzed and reanalyzed a bazillion times. And and that's one of the things people you know what does Dracula represent. Oh, the sexuality, oh, the strength, oh, you know, all the horror, but also the different shades of good and bad and all that stuff. But you've asked me specifically mm -hmm. what I think, and, and I think that it's an extension of what my great grand uncle was sort of trying to get at. And I got to know him very well in 12 years of intensive research. I found his notes, I found the typescript, I found his own journal. So Bram was a really broad-minded person, open-minded about many things. And uh, I think what he was also trying to look at is, and he, was, and he was the head of the Philosophical Society at the university he attended and the head of the Historical Society, as well as being an athlete. And he got his master's in mathematics. So he was a really well-rounded guy. But as a philosopher, I think he was exploring, kind of like you talked about, the different gradients of good and bad and evil. We know he was looking at truth and faith in the novel, and, and he, he connected these band of heroes who, was, who were out to hunt Count Dracula by their faith in goodness, 
and a little bit so with their faith in religion, because they still did use religious icons to, to repel the Count Dracula. But it wasn't that that simple. Um, there was there was the concept of if Dracula is simply trying to uh, proliferate himself, was he killing people? Yes, some, but he was also prolonging their life by exchanging blood. So there was different ways, and it's it's not so cut and dry. Nowadays, it's become very cut and dry when people analyze, well, this vampire movie, this is how you, you, you get killed by a vampire. This is how you get your blood drained, but then you drink their blood. So in Bram's story, it was very ambiguous. Lucy became a vampire, but who killed her? The band of heroes, her fiance, right? Yeah. Mina right. was was halfway turned into, she was in the process of being turned into a vampire. And yet Mina distributed these incredible feelings of pity for Count Dracula. And not many people pick up on that, but I've done an annotated Dracula mm. recently where you actually see in, in three different occasions, she says, have pity on him. You may need to do the same to me one day. In other words, if she can't, if they can't capture or kill him and she turns right. So there is somewhat of that, um, that Christian side of her. It's like, he may be bad. She hasn't forgiven him totally, but pity him. Be merciful. So Bram's exploring that a little bit. And then the other piece about Dracula is you've really got to, as, as, as you say, analyze this closely. He only appears in about 25% of the novel. Right. He exists in the minds, the psyches, the worries, the nightmares of all the other characters pretty consistently throughout the story. So where does he really live? You know, he's he's within the trauma that his, the, the concept of him, you know, taking an end of your life, but making you live as an undead, which, you know, in that purgatory type sense or, or in hell you know, is pretty horrifying. And then you being forced, if you are in this position, to go and do the same to others. So right. it's, I, I don't have a definitive answer, Todd. I just say that Bram was creating something that made people really think. He wanted us to really be challenged by this creature he created and get him into our heads and make us wrestle with good versus evil right versus wrong, right. life versus death. Uh, and that's that's one reason why he is not a defined character that's easy to wrap your arms around and say, this is Dracula. I think that's one reason why he's lasted 127 years in thousands of different iterations. He's not like Frankenstein. Sure. We don't get him at first. You know, This is him. <laughs> this is how you kill him. This is how you stop. Dracula is multifaceted, shape-shifting, means something different to different people. I know that's long-winded, but right. I, I want to no, that's let me great. throw that back it. at you, though. What, what do you think, since I've spilled my beans on it? I don't know. I don't know what to say. You know, I, my uh, thinking in, you know, in my books and things like that, I always write that, you know, good and evil are subject to interpretation. You yeah. know, they're really, yeah. there's a lot of gray there. I'm not so sure it's, it's uh, black or white with so much of this. And, um, you know, good and evil, right and wrong, you know, you're exactly right. And, and obviously there's more interpretations of this, of Dracula than just that book, because there's plenty of other content out yeah. there in this, yeah. in the wide world of entertainment. And sometimes Dracula is depicted as a straightforward villain. It's the bad guy that people want to kill, you know, he's the Darth Vader of the story, you know, like it's, so that's what it is, but I don't really know. I, I really, I really can't say I need to put more thought into it, but I thought it asked the expert. <laughs> well, but that's the cool thing is I, I don't think, I mean, I would love to sit around a bunch of experts. You'll probably get a different answer from each person. So there, there is, mm -hmm. you know, your answer isn't wrong. It's just, it's up to yeah. you to interpret because it is sure. so ambiguous. And, and you know, even the yeah. end of the novel, Todd, you know, th this is one of the cool things that I think exists. And it's one of the conundrums I, I discovered in Seattle, Washington. Paul Allen purchased the Dracula typescript for just under a million dollars. And when I was mm. able to analyze that, as my buddy Robert 18 Bissang did, who's no longer living, and we put it into an annotated Dracula, all the pieces that were taken out of the typescript. 
So you see this typed up manuscript of like almost 500 pages with lines crossed out. The original ending of the novel is, is crossed out. Hmm. So here's something for your listeners. Let's just run through this because it, it brings up the whole issue of ambiguity and did Dracula really, was he really expected to die at the end? So in the scene, in the book now, a lot of movies do it somewhat similar. You've got the band of heroes coming in three different directions, converging in on Count Dracula, who is in a crate, in a leisure wagon, being charged along by the gypsies and protected to get to the castle before the sun, the sun goes down. I mean, they don't care about that, but the band of heroes have to get to him before the sun goes down. Otherwise, he's got full power and they won't be able to destroy him. And they won't probably won't be able right. to get into the castle. So the, the good guys do intercept him, have a fight. Quincy Morris and Jonathan Harker gain access to the crate, rip the top off, and stab the count with a bowie knife, and Harker slits his throat. Now, at that point, Mina Harker in her journal says, and this look of peace came over his, his look of peace on his face, and he and he crumbled into dust. And we're, we're made to believe that, is that him shape-shifting and escaping? Is that him crumbling into dust and dying? Right after that, within a sentence, Bram had originally planned a volcanic eruption. And a huge volcanic eruption where, the, where they were in sight of the castle, on the mountain where the castle's up there. And this whole mountain goes up and blows up and the castle goes up and then it all envelops back down again. Luckily, the good guys are able to disappear. The gypsies take off. So we don't really know what was supposed to happen to the, the, to the people when this volcano erupts. But we, we sure know the castle's gone. And we also then understand that Bram Stoker planned specifically to have this castle on an extinct volcano. He actually left those map coordinates hmm. in his notes and in, in the, in the notes that now live in Philadelphia. And I have been to that mountaintop. Um, I used those coordinates with my son and with a uh, guide and some friends to convert that to GPS and go and check it out. It actually is a massive volcano that had blew its top a million years ago and exposed a massive sulfur mine. Uh, and, and Brian was so detail oriented that if he was going to have a volcanic eruption at the end of the story, by golly, it's going to be on a volcano. But the question is, why did that volcanic eruption come out? What was, would, would that have been far too a definitive ending to the count? And, and did his publisher take it out or did he take it out? And, and I think right. that's one of the cool questions about does Dracula survive this or, or did he die with the crumbling of the dust or was that his way to escape get and, and, and take off yeah for sure you know uh, uh, i think many people think of um vampires and creatures of the night as the occult was bram spiritual or religious both bram was a protestant practicing protestant mm-hmm. uh, you know married in a church and went to church all the time and all that but he was he was like many others of the day skeptical about the rigidity of religion and he was he, I mean, i've actually seen his bible he was given a bible at the age of 11. his cousins excuse me my cousins his great grandson own it and i've of course i have leafed through every page taught to make to see what's <laughs> anything marked up and there are three passages mm-hmm. marked up and one that caught my eye is is uh is accept God resists the devil. Just, just one of them. So, but I, and getting back to what I said is, so he was a religious guy, but he's also a very spiritual guy. And I believe at some point in his life, and I think it's after he started reading Walt Whitman and became a pen pal with Walt Whitman about the totality of life and, and sort of a, a movement called pantheism, which is sort of everything is, is all, you know, all religions are good, whatever you want to go for, but, but really think of Mother Earth, you know, as is above, as below. He was also a Freemason. So Bram was thinking about the sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, the water, and underneath the powerful 
powers of tectonic forces, volcanoes, earthquakes, all that stuff. When he wrote the book in, in Cruden Bay, Scotland, he's got all that right in front of him with massive outcroppings from, you know, rocks that had, you know, millions of years ago pushed together. It, it's an incredible place. And I'm sure that that had an, an impact. And I'm so glad you asked that question because not many people do to think, oh, was he a practicing occultist? He was aware of it. He was good friends with Pamela Coleman Smith, who was the first artist of the Smith uh, tarot, uh, Smith Waite tarot cards. He was a good friends with um, J. Brody Innes, who was a member of the Order of the Golden Dawn. He was a Freemason, as I said. He was just, a, I think, a broad-minded thinker that was open to all these yeah. things. And and that's that. I think they all crept their way into the novel in some way. Right. Um. Bram had written, what, a dozen books or more, but Dracula wasn't, was it a bestseller when it came out? Let's talk about that a little bit, about the rest of his body of work and kind of when Dracula became a phenomenon. Yeah, uh, I mean, his first book was a um, was a legal manual because his first job was as, as being a, a clerk in the Petty Sessions legal department in Dublin Castle of, in, in Ireland. And then he was promoted to the inspector of all 30 counties that had to travel around, much like Jonathan Harker, by the way, travel by train and carriage <laughs> to go and make sure all the clerks were doing their job. And he found out that it was all in disarray, no consistency. And he ended up writing a manual and published it himself called The Duties of Clerks of Petty Sessions. And it was in use till 1962. Uh, that was his first bestseller. But that was because it was <laughs> they had to buy it. <laughs> uh, he wrote a children's book about children's horror stories. Um, not not really sure because records were, were not really well kept in the day. So when yeah. Dracula came out, 1897, we don't we really don't know. We, besides, we know that the the first run was like you know 3,000 books or something. Don't know how long it took for, to sell those. But we the one thing we do know uh, because age of digitization that th there were two reviews out of the first eight that researchers have uncovered. Two were somewhat negative. And I say that negative in the way that, oh my God, this is so sensational. This is too horrifying for proper men and women to read. That type mm. of negativity, not that, oh, this is a terrible book. It's poorly written. You don't understand it. It's, this is just too much. And how could Bram Stoker have possibly written this? You know, the upstanding conservative theatrical manager. But the other ones, we're really quite good. It's like, oh, he's really pushed the edge of the boundary here. This is, you know, much in the line of Poe and, and Mary Shelley. So biographers have said, oh, Dracula was met with mixed reviews, almost like it was not good. Mixed, technically right, but six of them good and two not so good. And then when a friend of mine, Professor John Edgar Browning, who wrote a whole book on this stuff, as well as Dracula and visual media, he's written a lot of stuff on, on Bram Stoker and Dracula. He found over 90 reviews, and the percentage was like 98% really good as far as reviews from all over the world. Mind you, this was oh, these reviews were not all written when Bram was still alive. He died in 1912. So a lot of these reviews start happening in the 20s and the 30s after Dracula made its way onto the stage and screen. And the book gained more popularity because of Lugosi and, and others on stage and screen. So it's it's sort of hard to really track back like they do nowadays about when exactly did it become a bestseller? Why? Who was the publicity manager? All that stuff that I don't think, you know, Bram really knew. I know he would have probably read the reviews that were available to him because he did look at a lot of reviews of, of course, Henry Irving's acting and so on. So, um, you know, that's it's kind of a shame that he never really saw the real fruits of his labor. The book that was a bestseller was 1905 when Henry Irving died, a book called Personal Reminiscence of Henry Irving. And it was not a horror story. It wasn't fictional. It was more of a tell-all, two volumes of Bram Stoker's life, 27 years with Henry Irving, Sir Henry Irving, the most famous actor of his time. That was highly successful. But the other mm. ones just kind of floated around. And, and it's kind of too bad because I think there's some really good short stories. And I'm in the process of 
trying to turn some of those into graphic novels, even getting some of those into audio books. So people, you know, more, more circulation. And my second favorite of all of them is The Mystery of the Sea, which is a, a, a got some supernatural element to it. It's a thriller, got a little bit of horror to it, but it's re- it's set in Scotland in the same area where Bran wrote the book. So, um, yeah, that's a bit of an overview into how things were during his lifetime. And, uh, you know, 1962 yeah. was a big year when the book went became a classic. And that's when it, yeah. it, it really... When Oxford deemed it a classic, it became acceptable for uh, scholars to start analyzing it and using it for serious dissertation. And it got a lot of notice sure. that way as well. <clears throat> Let's talk for a minute about how you're carrying on the Dracula stories and Bram's legacy. Well, that that sort of started off, you know, with um, just getting interested into who the guy was. I was a school teacher, athletic coach, and wanted to know, much like I do with teachers and athletes, you know, what makes them tick? How can I get the best out of them? And when I started researching um, to to write with Ian Holt, Dracula the Undead, the sequel to Dracula, I found Bram's journal in in his great-grandson's attic in the Isle of Wight. And that gave me a a lot of insight into Bram. It took two years along with Dr. Elizabeth Miller to transcribe it and publish it. Um, during that time, I started becoming more accepted, you know, really in the world of serious scholar. Um, and also, you know, going to conventions in, in pop culture world, because it's easy to just have the name Stoker and ride those coattails and not produce anything. And just, just sure. be the guy that, you know, leeches off of the fame of somebody. But I, I'm not that kind of person. Um, you know, I, I need to prove myself. That goes back to my athletic career. You know, you're only as good as your last victory or defeat, you know, whatever it is, keep improving. And so I wanted to be a producer. So writing Drag the Undead was in, in 2009, became an international bestseller. And, and then I published the, the Lost Journal. And then I had this thing in me that I just knew this extra story was there looking into everything and I found the right guy to co-author with because I'm just not strong enough writer to do it by myself. I found J.D. Barker to do Dracul, which is a prequel to Dracula. It's a life, it's Bram Stoker's life, fictionalized uh, into him writing Dracula as a warning to the world that vampires are real. And that also has become uh, an international bestseller and it's been optioned and, uh, you know, crossing our fingers that it might be working its way towards being a streaming series someday. But with all that going on, again, more appearances, doing lectures, getting invited to be on, on, on TV, you know, documentaries and so on. I've got a documentary right now that's going to, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm heading to Romania to, to premiere it over there. It's about my search for Bram Stoker's fictional castle. Um, and, and so there's lot, lots of those things in the works. I've got something called the Stokerverse with a guy in, uh, in Edmonton, Alberta, a fellow Irishman who uh, is helping me with RPG games, board games. Um, we, we've even got a video game coming out. All of these things, Todd, are sort of homages and throwbacks to Bram's original Dracula. So the overriding yeah. arch of everything I've just mentioned in the last five minutes is, is not sort of a negative reaction to the way vampires have turned in, nowadays. You know, the sparkly vampires, the sexy vampires, all that. But it's more to say, hey, guys, this is where it all started. And I'm lucky because I've got access to the notes, the typescript, the journal. I know what did make it into Dracula. I know things that were edited out. And I'm using those things to insert back into these games and other books, things that were yeah. partially fleshed out. So that's how I'm carrying on Bram's sort of legacy, some of his ideas, keeping them going. But I also protect it. You know, my wife and I have, have done licensing um, projects just to make sure that people are going to pick brand commercially. By golly, they're going to do it right. And uh, we are a resource yeah. as well for people writing yeah. biographies. And, and I got lots of people wanting to write stories and they either want permission or they want to do it right. And, and that's satisfying because for a family member and my son is following in my footsteps, he's a Ph.D. in English literature. I hope he'll carry the banner a little bit to make sure people understand, 
who Graham was. So the creator yeah. is almost as famous as the creation. That was that was one of my questions toward the end was whether this will continue with the next generation of Stokers that they'll keep this keep this going. I, I hope so, and, and my son's got the bug, but right now he's he's heavily into um, Ernest Hemingway and uh, Faulkner, um, and, and but he has come with me on my trips to uh, to Ireland, to Scotland, Transylvania when we, when I lead tours. He's come along because because he's interested. Uh, from from both a literary standpoint and a fam- family standpoint, and uh, he he was actually very helpful on that treacherous mountain climb we did on the extinct <laughs> volcano in Transylvania because it got pretty hairy with the weather closing in on us and uh, the fog coming in and having to seek refuge in a high mountain weather station. So yeah, Parker's uh, in, into this. My wife is great help doing all the sort of the legal side of things. Um, so yeah, I think it's. Th- you know, Bram Stoker's in good hands. The family is there, uh, keep keeping his legacy alive for at least the next generation or two. So I'm curious, with Dracula being such an old character, is Dracula technically in the public domain? What's the status on that? Yes. Is that why everyone can make movies and stories about it? Anyone can do a Dracula story? Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yep. Dracula became mm. public domain uh, as it went a classic 62. Uh, movie rights, mm. stage rights were actually... Uh, just, just a quick one there. Bram knew enough because he was theater manager and had a legal background to protect the dramatic rights of the book by having a stage reading done in on its theater. And it was just a stage reading, not a play. Uh, they just read one, w- one script. And that script, Bram literally cut up two copies of a Dracula book and stuck it on a page with stage directions and passed it between like 10 different uh, readers. And he got a certificate. Um, and I've seen the certificate from the, and it's now sits in the British Museum archives. And and Bram left that to his to his widow. So when, when he died, she actually made a lot of money working with Dean and Balderston uh, to go on stage with Dracula and then Todd Browning film. But those, I think those rights have expired. I, I don't really know who if Universal still has those because they split them off to Hammer. Um, but I know if, if you wanted to write a book right now and, and have Dracula in it, no problem. If you want to make your own movie and have a Dracula in it, no problem. Um, so that's, yeah. yeah, public domain has its benefits because it, it ha- helps the proliferation of this character. He is the second most adapted literary character to screen behind Sherlock Holmes. Um, so th- wow. that, that probably has helped because of public domain. I didn't know that. That's That's fascinating. And I assume the same, you know, is true for all the rest of the characters in that book that you could, you know, pretty much move any of those characters into their own things, which brings up this, my question about this Renfield movie that came out with Nick Cage this year, which I actually really enjoyed. It was a fun comedy, almost like Nick Cage was built for that role. (laughs) Really, I was really happy with what I saw there, but you know, the origin of Renfield, let's dig into that a little bit and, and how Bram you know, was, uh, was, was part of that and, and how much of that character was developed versus what it turned into later on. That's uh, I, I think that the movie has stemmed that question, that issue more than any of the other movies, even though the Renfield character in, in the different movies, you know, the 92 Coppola, played by Tom Waits and, you know, 31. I mean, they're all wonderful and interesting character, but the origin of it, Todd, is, is an interesting question. I've, I've really considered this. And I believe that it is, an, again, it is an extension. Bram placed Renfield in this novel for a very specific reason. Number one, his mother was a huge advocate of people with mental health problems. You know, back in the day, they called them the deaf and the dumb. You know, not not you wouldn't use that to this day. Deaf and the mute. Um, how to chart? How to analyze? How to decide if somebody's criminally insane? She delivered these papers to this all male statistical and social inquiry society, which was very big for a female to do in Dublin, Ireland at the time. So that was something she was passionately interested in. Her oldest son, Bram's oldest brother, Sir William Thornley Stoker, was a very well known doctor. He was knighted for his contributions to medicine. He was the head of the Royal College of Surgeons. He served in two different types of hospitals. He served in 
the hospital dealing with physical ailments as well as mental ailments. And he was also an inspector of vivisection, which meant the ethical uh, surgeries on, on brains on, of animals. So both of these influences in his life, as well as Bram's own interest, and recently Jason McGilligan from Marsh's University in Dublin, Ireland, discovered the manuscript for that book I told you earlier, Personal Reminiscence. And Bram actually had mentioned him going to Millbank Prison in London and interviewing mental health uh, in, as, uh, inmates, you know, because in those days was was inmate, uh, pr mental health people were just thrown into prisons. It was asylums were just beginning to to be established. So all these this personal interest in the Stoker family, I am sure, came out when Bram started writing the story and saying, "This is a statement." We're going to have an asylum. We're going to have a guy in here who is very useful to the story and has a lot of interesting information to, to pass on. And we're going to talk about the treatment of them, how Dracula was a, an evil scientist forcing him to make these eat these bugs. That was an experiment that Dracula was projecting on him. Um, and, and so this, again, this was sort of like, as you said at the top of the show, this was a microscope that you could look at the novel and say what was going on in society at this time. And by golly, the plight and treatment of people you know, with mental problems being thrown into prisons, Bram decided to, to highlight that with his character Renfield and, and how they, the good guys treated him, how the bad guys treated him, and how also Thornley Stoker, funnily enough, described in the notes, how exactly to do brain trephination surgery on Renfield after he got beat up and he had brain swelling and he was going to die. And these two men, Van Helsing and Seward, decided, oh, we must do surgery on him. Now, if you think about that nowadays, it's a no-brainer. But in those days, a mental patient, they would have just let him die in a corner, sadly. They would not have had that type of mercy. But th this was showing they did the right thing. He needed this surgery. They did it. It was experimental, but they still did it. And sadly, he, you know, we, we were led to believe he died on the table, so to speak. But long-winded, that's why he's in the story, is that it was a major issue, not only in the Stoker family, but in the society at the time. And Bram wanted that reflected properly, mercifully, in the story. Yeah. You know, I, I think when Renfield is presented in pop culture, it usually is in a comedy film. And I think that's that's important. What you're talking about, the seriousness of the Renfield character yeah. and all the stuff you just mentioned, yet Renfield's like a buffoon and the movies that he shows up in, it, it tends to lean toward comedies. In fact, uh, I'm trying to remember the George Hamilton Dracula movie. Was that Love at First Bite? I think so. Yeah. That he did was, yeah. and the Renfield in that is like my favorite Renfield of all the Renfields I've ever seen depicted in a film. But again, Renfield's always presented there, you know, for comedy. Now in this current Renfield movie is a little bit more action adventure comedy, but, uh, but it's still, he's still there for comedy. What do, what do you think about that? Is that a disservice to his character? Well, I mean, it, it is sometimes it's a delicate issue to depict somebody with a mental health problem accurately, because you're touching on, you know, a very delicate issue that you're going to offend people if you, if you do it in the wrong way. Um, so why not just turn him into a humorous character so you're not touching on a delicate issue? But, you know, Bram mm -hmm. didn't have those constraints back in the day, and he wanted to make a statement. Um, incidentally, I will tell you a, a cool piece of trivia. In the notes, he was simply known as Flyman. So Bram had names for his characters, and you could see how they've evolved over these 125 pages of notes. And it wasn't until the typescript that he was introduced as Renfield. And my theory is, because I've kind of looked at when Bram Stoker and Irving traveled to certain places by looking at newspapers and looking at the reviews of newspapers in different places. And I have figured out that I think he stopped writing the story, I know, sometime in 1896, 
because I know some of the newspaper articles had things in them that he used in the novel, specifically ones in the New, in the New York World newspaper. And they were in Glasgow, Scotland in 96. And right outside the train station, which is very close to the hotel they stayed in, which is very close to the theater, to this day is Renfield Street. And hmm. it, wow. it just it's just too too to me coincidental that they, they he would have walked out right. there, boom, oh it's up, we've got to turn, take a left on Renfield Street, we go here, take a left on Renfield. And and it and I've done right. the research, it was named Renfield Street back in eighteen ninety six too. So wow. you know, his names came from weird different places, but the issue that we just talked about, I think comes from the heart and also comes from, you know, the morality of those stokers that, you know, this 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 is an important issue, and I'm going to insert him into this book. Yeah. You attend a lot of uh, pop culture conventions around the world, and you do book signings everywhere. Why do you think people still find Dracula content so alluring? Poof. Um, I get so many different sort of comments from people about, I, I, I read this book every year around Halloween. Um, I've, I've read the book and now I watch all these movies, you know, and, and I do say, well, wh what do you get out of it? Oh, it's, you know, it's a, at some level, it's so mysterious. It's spooky. It's sexy. You know, the idea of the afterlife, kind of like we said, at, you know, 15 minutes ago, there is not one thing, but, but again, I've got my theories here. The concept of Dracula comes from the realistic fears that people had of vampirism, which exist in, in superstition and folklore all over the world in different forms. Bram did that research. The one interview he ever gave, he mentioned 12 countries that he founded in. If you or I were starting to do that, Todd, we'd probably find 30 countries, easy, where they, they, they would have something to do with a spirit, an afterlife, coming out of the grave, sucking life, out of others. So this is right. something rooted. This monster, the, the concept of the monster is rooted in something people really believed in. And, you know, up until 1896 in, in, in the New England states, people believed that the vampire was real when they allowed over 50 exhumations of graves and it was all because of tuberculosis outbreak. And yet religion couldn't provide an answer. Medicine couldn't provide an answer why people were dying. They didn't quite understand the germ theory. And their superstition was so strong going back, you know, a couple hundred years in their families that they believed that that TB outbreak in New England states in 18, the late 1890s was vampirism. And they've even had a 2004, I was on a PBS special that actually had a guy in Romania doing a modern day vampire exhumation and cutting a guy's heart out burning it at crossroads and feeding the ashes to somebody. So it's not like wow. it's something that once you understand, hey, you got it, we've moved on. That whole idea of the spirits floating around, doing malicious things, you know, taking taking the life from others one way or another, that's not completely dead in the water. So I think that's why there's still an allure of the vampire not because he's he, he, he just can't close them up. It's, it's, you know, identify them over and done with. Nope. It's still like, my gosh, maybe there's something there to this. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I agree. It's definitely not going anywhere. Vampires, werewolves, all of these things. So, so popular in pop culture. I think back of, you know, a lot of the books that I enjoyed, when I was young, even James Bond is a stale franchise now. And I love those books. But again, it's the lens of today, looking yeah. back on what that guy was like. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, and then there were like lesser known characters. Like I was a big fan of Doc Savage and Doc Savage on the surface should be a really cool character. He knows all this stuff, has all these adventures, you know, his own kind of uh, Bond character in a way. But Doc Savage just never really materialized in anything popular in books, but never really went anything further. And, and you see that a lot in fantasy too uh you know like we'll never the lord of the rings books the hobbit will always be around there's always going to yeah. be a uh, something really fascinating about that fantasy world that was created so there's just certain things that are just amazing and, 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 and um, you could say the same and, for star wars 
you know, those, those mm -hmm. you know, very, very multi-complex, uh, cr 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 you know, uh, world that's created by very creative people stimulates mm -hmm. more people to get involved and, and create yeah. in interesting adventures going forward. And, and the Dracula sort of franchise is, is very similar. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm a perfect example of that. It's just that, you know, I'm going back with Chris McCauley to, to the origins of it that people have kind of left. You know, they kind of moved on so quickly. We're going back and say, hey, wait a sec, folks. You know, it, it may be, you know, 2023, but let's go back and see where it all started and, and revive that revenant type of monster out of the grave that Bram created. That all, the man all dressed in black. It's pure horror and, you know, really evil. Um, very, mm -hmm. very little moral compass going on here. You know, not a lot of whole, you know, should I kill or should I not? You know, sure. that's, that's the guy. And, that, that, and, and to me, that's kind of new to this generation that may be getting involved and getting introduced to it. So, you know, we've waited long enough, 127 years since the book came out. It's time to go back to the roots of it all. Sure. And Dacre, what's coming up in 2024? Is there, is there anything you can talk about now that uh, you're looking forward to for the year or that you have coming yeah, out? No, that's, that's a great question. And I mean, uh, I've started working with uh, Experience Transylvania Tour Company. We've got, uh, we, we go to England and we look at, uh, we spend a couple of days in the town of Whitby. This is in May. So the end of May, we go to Whitby where Bram wrote chapter six, seven, and eight, stayed there for a couple of weeks. Uh, we go to the nearby town of Robin Hood's Bay, where Bram actually set part of the story as well. And we go to York, um, where, where Bram visited, but the novel doesn't take place. But it's a very cool medieval place to hang out. Then um, a few days later, another tour starts in Transylvania. I've been doing that now for, God, I've been about 14 times. Uh, this is early June. I take interested fans to, to want to go and see sites associated with both Vlad Dracula and Count Dracula. So it's kind of a fictional, factual tour. Places set in the novel, even though Brand didn't go there, I we know exactly where he set the story. He had so many accurate books and maps. We follow the footsteps, um, and we can actually go to this site of the fictional castle. We go to Brand Castle, that Brand actually modeled the exterior of Castle Drac after. We go to places like Sigi Schwara, Targoviste, Puanari, where Vlad Dracula did his thing. So those are my two big tours I've got going. Uh, the, my documentary film, uh, In Search of Castle Dracula, is coming out. And, and hopefully there's some other film works that uh, are, are in the works. This video game, the Stokerverse video game, Dracula Dark Reign, is coming out. Um, I've got a story that is out there now being looked at publishers. It's the summer that Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. I wrote this with Dr. Leverett Butts, a professor at University of North Georgia. That's being looked at, but it is... A very strange summer for Bram Stoker in Cruden Bay, Scotland, when he actually wrote Dracula. So those those are things to look look forward to coming out. And then lots of appearances in cool different places where I love to meet the fans, give my Stoker and Stoker lectures, that sort of thing. What platform is the video game coming out on? You know, I, I shouldn't have even said it because I, I couldn't tell you, but I know uh, Chris <laughs> McCauley can tell you. So... Uh, what you guys sure. got to do is, yeah. is incubate Spacebot is the company. And I know it's kind of one of these handheld retro things. Uh, all I know is. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I, I, I helped write the story uh, and it's all about yeah. Jonathan Harker trying to get out of the castle. Um, but this sure. whole thing oh, about that these sounds retro fun. games are apparently very cool. Yeah, for sure. Well, I love video games myself, so you never know. There's so much you could probably do with with that character and the type of game that you could uh, you well, could do. Well, if you like them so Lots much, a... I've been told that just a couple of days ago a playable promo is out, and you need to go to I think Incubate, I N C U B, and then the number eight or Space Bots website, and you can actually play uh, a promo for it. So. Right. Well, Dacre, I got to let you go so I can go play that game go, now. No. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we got to cut this short. There's a video game to That's be played cool. now. Yeah. And um, also, you can find me and all my other works, stokerverse.com. It's where Chris McCauley and I do all these board games, video games, books we write. Yeah. And then uh, my wife and I run bramstokerestate.com where you can buy my books or look at the stuff that we do sell. But it's also. Are you on social media? Uh, Dacre Stoker author on Facebook and Instagram. 
So there we go. Gotcha. Yeah. Good, good. Well, you know, last questions here before we go. Is there a is there an incarnation of Dracula that's your favorite? Of anything that's been put out there, what's been your favorite, favorite thing to see? Uh, you know, that's tough, tough question. And, and I try to, you know, ride the fence. I mean, I like the 92 Coppola film. Uh, I really like The Last Voyage of the Demeter that just came out uh, because that's a th- good oh, yeah. throwback horror movie. Uh, but I also like the 1979 Louis Jordan, or is it 77? The BBC did a mini series that's very faithful to the book. But for pure entertainment, I do like the Coppola film. It's not faithful to the novel per se, but it's, it's still a pretty good, pretty good darn movie. Sure. Yeah, everybody likes it. That's a favorite for a lot of people. Do you think that there is a story in there for television of, you know, young Bram Stoker, seeing him grow up, go through all the things that he went through, all the way through his his publishing and and getting Dracula off the ground and his researches and travels? Would that be a fun show? Let, let me just guess. Have you been looking at my private emails? Um, <laughs> there, there, there is, I am definitely, and I've got to be careful with NDA sitting right behind me. Um, I, I, sure. I'm very interested in creating a biopic, put it that way. And I think mm-hmm. what you just said, I think fans would be very interested in his life mm-hmm. and what it took to write this story and all the weird, the, the ways his life and his research were, were woven into the fabric of the story. So, uh, I hope. And a beautiful period piece in Ireland in that at that time Absolutely. would just be really incredible to see. Yeah, Ireland and you London. Know. And then the places where things happened, you know, just, you know, in in Whitby. We didn't even get into so much. And I think maybe this is lost on the listeners right now. But if you can, you could go out and find this information easily enough. But we didn't even, you and I didn't even really get in to talk about, uh, you know, like a lot of his childhood ailments and kind of the things that he, he, he went through and his, his uh, searches for spirituality and all that. It's very fascinating life he had. Yeah, And, And, you know, where you hear something that's, like the thing about the employee manual, a little boring, but it's also a very interesting thing to throw into this guy's life when he, you know, he had so many uh, diverse interests. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I really think it'd be very cool. So I hope that happens. Well, Dacre, thanks for coming out, and uh, and let's do this again. Absolutely, it's always good to talk to someone like you, Todd, who got good questions, good listener, and uh, very interesting uh, to chat with you and hear what you've got to say about all this. So yeah, let's do it again sometime. Yep, for sure. We'll talk All soon. Right. Take, Take care. care. Metacortex Publishing hopes that you've enjoyed this presentation. Please take a moment to listen to some other podcast offerings from Metacortex Publishing. The No Earthly Explanation podcast investigates the things that are unexplainable. Hosted by world-renowned investigative researcher Donald R. Schmidt and scientist Ellie Ringo. Follow them as they look for evidence for things that have no earthly explanation available anywhere you listen to podcasts cult following is a podcast that studies the personalities and common traits of cult leaders and their followers get the real story behind these infamous and oftentimes tragic cults from a new perspective through exhaustive research and from interviews with people that were there available anywhere you listen to podcasts Hi, I'm Father Daniel DePlantis, a Catholic priest, martial artist, and host of the Karate Priest Podcast. Have you ever wondered what the church teaches about different topics? Are you a martial arts enthusiast or just someone who wants to learn more about martial arts? I'd like to invite you to join me and many guests on my podcast as we cover topics of faith, everyday living, and martial arts on the Karate Priest Podcast. I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and I host the podcast A Catholic's Perspective. Join me every two weeks as I release episodes targeted towards helping young Catholics navigate their ever-changing secular world while staying strong in their faith. Whether you are a Catholic or not, all are welcome here. So if this is something that interests you, feel free to tune in. You can find A Catholic's Perspective on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I hope to see you there. Bye! Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and Anthony Smith and is distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. 
Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for Metacortex Publishing at metacortexpublishing.com or find us on social media for other unique content.